Right, so our next uh, speaker making his way to the stage is uh, Alan Hambrook, who is the CEO of Zorro Labs. Uh, and if you haven't heard of Zorro Labs, well, I'm sure Alan's going to tell us more about it anyway, but they are a specialist software company that, among other things, specializes in behavioral modeling uh, and delivering solutions based on unstructured data, which clearly is something we've heard a bit about today. Uh, Alan's been in the business for over 30 years, found a number of different uh, software companies specializing in complex packaged uh, solutions. Um, I think a lot of his work currently is in the banking sector, so it follows on nicely from the last presentation. Um, but let me say no more about that. Alan is going to talk to us about behavioral data and the use of that data in predictive analytics. Alan Hamburg. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Thank you for inviting us. Um, you've sat through a number of presentations already. It's getting towards the end of the day, so I'll keep this very quick and very to the point. I'm very happy to take questions afterwards. Um, as John rightly pointed out, I'm going to be talking about the work that we've been doing over the last 10 years, using unstructured data first and then behavioral and social data that are available. Um, what I'd like to do is to set some of the context of that. By that type of data, I'll explain more about the types of data we use. I mean the data that comes from the web, from Facebook, digital fingerprints that come from the devices that people use, the way they hit the keyboard, the way they actually work with an application form that Dan was showing us earlier, so all of that data and how we can then use it in various applications. Now, to set the context for that, Zoran itself is an artificial intelligence machine learning research and development company. We've been doing that for many years. We've been incorporating that current form for about 10 years. We have about 150 mathematicians and scientists working for something like that. And we work in predictive analytics primarily. Um, and we've been mostly working in the finance sector. That's not because we're totally finance oriented, it's because the finance sector tends to pioneer these things and tends to invest in. We also work in other behavioral systems, human behavior. We work in bioinformatics as well, where these techniques also apply. We work particularly at risk and fraud, which tends to be a very big focus of finance institutions. Our clients are mostly financial institutions who supply products to consumers and small businesses. So they're lending money, or they're selling insurance policies, or something like that. <clears throat> we also work in a very specific world, which has its, its very peculiar demands on what we do. We work in STP processing. So straight through processing, online, on the web. Someone is filling an application form, they're clicking through, 30 seconds later, they hit the yes button, then the decision platform is yes, you've got the money, it's in your bank five minutes later. So we're working in a very, very high speed environment where decisioning is happening real time as someone is actually using the system. We'll come on to more in a minute. We also work because of that to a very high level of automation. Some of our clients are processing vast amounts of data where human intervention just isn't physically. So decisioning engines really supported almost completely by the AI platforms that sit underneath. And we have been something of a pioneer in that field. We're told, and what if it's true, we built the first major online lending system in the world. We built one this system and platform, we built many others throughout the world. So we've been working in this field for some time. And geographically, we work in North America, Europe, Australasia, and now Africa with mobile credit and mobile banking as well. So that's a bit about the context on us. What about the context on our clients? <laughs> what our clients do primarily is lend money or sell insurance. <clears throat> they mostly sell it to people they don't know. Now, of course, they sell it for repeat business to clients they've already engaged for some time, but a lot of the problems that we're talking about today is someone coming to their website they've never seen before, they don't know them, and they're about to transact with them. So there's some challenging issues there about data and markets. And also, we work in very small sectors where the data set all of them are not exactly rich, right up to the very large ones. So that in itself poses quite a challenge in the diversity and the demographics there. All of our clients, or most of them, have an existing platform. So they've got a system there that's doing something, therefore it has to be built around. And of course, they're involved in selling their products, in marketing, they need to understand metrics around that. They're underwriting, they're collecting cash and so forth. And it's just come up before in the last session, obviously they have to comply. They've got to comply with legislation and so on. So, questions they ask themselves, their basic needs are, I get leads, they're referred to my website, maybe from Google or something, which leads should I accept? 
I get from different channels, referrals and so forth. Is this channel any good? Is that channel good? If I accept his leads or that lead over there, what impact is it going to have my collections in three months' time? I'm very interested in the cascade of how this works right from the very first point that someone touches their system. And also, if someone touches their system, they start coming in, which product should I sell? <laughs> should I sell page A with this product or page B with that product? Depending on how I see that person behaving and what information I can do. This is happening in real time. And of course, we're interested if I do accept him, is he going to pay? Is he going to default? What's the probability? What's the risk? What's the price that I should associate with that given the risk profile of this person? And of course, fraud has always popped up. First party, third party fraud, linked fraud, velocity, linked accounts, those sort of things all the time. Collections has been discussed as well, but should I be taking action before that problem occurs? Should I send a text message next Wednesday before the default occurs that might encourage them to have to pay and so forth? So all those kind of behaviours on our side, not just the client side, come to play. And of course, is that client going to renew? And the last point, very important point, affordability. They might put their salaries out, but maybe it's not true. So how can I assess all of those things around the behaviour of the person to get some idea of whether or not they can actually afford the product I'm selling them, because that's part of my so as you can imagine, it's just a few of the items, but our clients have very, very specific needs, and most of these are say, happen in real time in the process. So those are the problems. We need to do it in real time, straight through process, and we haven't got time for people to get involved, so it's pretty highly automated. So the problem with that, primarily, is you can't do it with conventional data. So if I go to experience, that's nothing the wrong with that data, wonderful data is excellent, we'll use it, but you can't fulfill those needs with that data. So that raises some questions then. <clears throat> if we do add other data, and for the moment we'll just call it behavioural, social and structured data, does it help? Can we solve those problems? If it does help, how much? <laughs> because if you start in that data, does it really move the dial significantly? Because it's a small trick. And if you are going to use it, what are the issues? Because there's no free lunch. When we start bringing these things in, obviously it creates other problems and other issues. So let's just talk briefly about those now. That's a very quick I'll start by answering the questions at the highest possible level and we'll move down to some examples. Does it help? Yes, it does. <laughs> a great deal, otherwise we'll be discussing it. How much? Too much to ignore. Too much to not start taking interest in. Too much for the big banks that make us just not to be phoning us and asking us how does this stuff work? Because it's happening around, uh, especially as long as here. Then what are the issues? Well, which data? Which vectors shall I use of the millions that I could possibly collect? Which ones are predictive? But not just which ones are predictive, but when? A certain field might be marvellously predictive for a 40-year-old man, year old man in South London, but for a 35-year-old woman in Manchester, it may not work. So we need to understand what vectors are applicable in which combination and when to a split portfolio structure which is infinitely more granular than has been looked at over the last 20 or 30 years, typically in the finance system. And do these things just apply to finance? No. They apply much, much wider than that. What we'll do with finance today because we'll have time to talk about other examples. And also, as we mentioned before, it tends to be finance and industry that pushes the vote out because they've got the money, so they tend to to invest. So, what do we mean by behavioural and social data? Well, obviously, most people know that, but let's just pick some examples. So, let's take the form that Dan was mentioning earlier. It's a typical application form, putting a name and address and postcode and salary. So if we ask them to put their bank details in, did they key it? Did they cut and paste it? Did they use Control C, Control V, or copy edit, copy paste? How fast did they do it? How long did it take in between this field and that? That's what we mean by behavioural data. We then, if they log into Facebook, take the entire Facebook account. We have semantic analysis going through, not just taking the words and the structures, but the actual data entities. So for example, we'll take how many friends have we got? Would you think that the number of friends on Facebook is predicted? Well, yes, it is, under certain circumstances. We'll take the date difference between the age they declare on their application form and what we see in Facebook, which will be surprising, <laughs> quite different sometimes. And sometimes the behaviours we see in Facebook are different from what they actually say in Facebook, so maybe Facebook isn't actually true. <clears throat> they say, the likes for this is here. And what things do they like? Do the people who like this pop group default more than people like that? Well, it happens. So we can take all of these combinations and start to interpret them. How many do we take? Well, in 30 seconds to one minute of interaction, roughly, we take between four to 8,000 data items on each individual. 
Now that's a little bit old because it's about 10,000 now. So it's gone up a bit and it's going up all the time. And we'll talk in a moment about how much of that you reuse because we're taking some data items that we don't even use today because we don't know how to. We're just taking it because we guess that someday we might have some use for it. But we're using about 4,000 at the moment, something like that. Now, that's what we're using them for. I don't think we're supposed to go anywhere near describing that because you can see there's a lot of functions there where this data can be used. And the interesting thing is it's not just used for one. But that whole behavioural scenario that we can build up this huge, huge n-dimensional image is actually difficult to think about all of them. Someone asked a question about the cross-polarity between different models and different departments. There isn't different departments. There's one human being, and we can now see this image which applies to how we behave. And there are people that like this product, will they pay us some time? What's the collections going to look like? Do I have to send them a text to we just get them paid? All these things we can start to interpret from this massive multi-dimensional model, this human being is interacting with. And that's some more sort of headline items that we're sort of working on. Okay, so let's look at one example. I'd like to show you there's also a lot of time to do it. <clears throat> this is one client, it's a real client, and they are a large consumer SME finance company. They do most of their work online, so most of their lending is done over the internet. They have a conventional loan management system, just a household name loan management system, they had a conventional underwriting platform and used credit bureaus for it. They also had advanced identity verification tools which they were using as well to try and validate the person was actually who they were saying. Um, but they had issues because behind the scenes there was too much manual effort for that given scaling problems. And also they had too high a fraud and too high a default. In fact, in certain products it wasn't profitable. So they had to fix those problems. Quite a bit of first and third party. Now the other picture too is that in some areas, de geographically and product-wise, they had quite low examples of, of, of no negative. So we didn't have a huge data set to work with in some areas, particularly in the mobile field. They had some wide country, secular, and cultural differences as well, which doesn't help. So quite a rapidly changing difference <coughs> run. So we started to collect a very large amount of behavioural data and started to build a model based on that. And we started to inject that in between their own application data. So like the form that Dan showed us earlier, with the straight application, name, address, address, kind of We started to inject that data in between, social data, and also then started a sort of a closed loop learning circle of looking at some of the post decision behaviours too, because that's not our only interaction with the customer. When we actually accept them, stuff goes on afterwards. So you can start to see some of these loops feeding in that. And in doing that, as you can see, we reduced the form rate from 4% down to 0 which is quite a big, significant difference. But the interesting thing there is that the manual processing reduced close to zero. It would have been zero, but for some compliance issues they had to fulfill, it went down from 30% down to zero. At which point you might say that's great. Anyone can fix a form problem, just accept less risky people, which is true. You can do that. But interestingly, the acceptance rates went up. So they were rejecting good people and still getting too many rules. So by taking that behaviour data out, we were able to filter out the fraudulent ones, but also boost, at the same time, the number of people accepted, because there were more good ones tucked away and there that the credit scoring systems were too blunt to identify. That's what I mean by a holistic view of the person. This is not one problem brushed into 50 different modules and departments. It's one problem. It's the person and their behaviour. And also, as we can see, the default rate was hard in particular areas. This is in other countries, not just the UK. They had a rate of 20% went down to single digit, but went about 70% So, very significant impact. So, behavioural data moves the dials, moves it in quite a big way. <clears throat> now, let's look at the split of the data we were using. We were using, for that particular example, about 4,000 data items collected real time during the interaction of the mobile phone with the, with the web browser. Those fed into about 400 models, that sounds quite a lot, but we use a lot of combination models with aggregation and boosting strategy to get these kind of results. But interestingly, let's see where that data came from. About 8% of it came from the normal credit bureau sources. Not very much. About 40% came from the online behaviour we've just described. 10% came from social media, Facebook and so forth. 12% came from unstructured documents, like sending you back statements and reading those, or you know, your, your CV or whatever else it might be. And about 30% came from the application itself, the app that they're filling in, and one of them is Now, interestingly, you might say, okay, 
But that 8% coming from the bureaus, maybe that was the most important 8%. <laughs> that's the thing that's doing all the work. But what comes up, and I'll show you some interesting graphs later on, which I think are actually the most interesting bit of the presentation later on. Those were some of the models that we used, and some of the techniques that we used, I should say, rather than the actual models. All conventional stuff, neural networks, SVMs, and so forth. The only issue that I'd say that we do tend to use is a large one of combination models for boosting, which we do need to use with behavioral data. We can't just take one single model and hope we'll get a silver bullet if that doesn't work. <clears throat> so what are the issues, given that there's no free lunch? <clears throat> well, it's the data. It's not the models. And we have a great number of mathematicians in our, in our, 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 our organisation, very bright, and many of the people here too, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, but actually, the models are not the problem. The models are complex, yes, but they're not that difficult. The issue is really the data. And the first and most important is, which bits should I use? Which bits are going to be predicted? But not just which bits are going to be predicted, but when? And also, they might be predicted this Wednesday, but by next Thursday, maybe it's true. So we have to have not only the actual models themselves, but an AI infrastructure managing this to monitor the performance of these things in real time. Gone are the days in this day when we just shovel model and say, yep, fine, great, see you in six months. We'll carry on working. It doesn't work like that before. So we actually have to engineer platforms that only design and build these things to produce the models to take the data. We also have to design systems to manage and model those and actually control and monitor them in real time to see that they don't go off piece halfway through the process. Which brings us to our second point, quality. <laughs> That's the biggest issue of all. I don't know how much we've invested in that. In fact, of all the investment we've made as a company, in people, and time, and money, and so forth, and so they just bust up into where it's gone. A very, very long proportion of it has gone into ensuring that unstructured data is a sufficient quality, and here I'm talking about precision data, probably 95, 96, 97 percent better, so that it can be used for predictive purposes. Because unstructured data is messy. <laughs> so one has to get it into a very high quality state. Facebook is messy. Even behavioural data taken from the web is relatively messy. So we need to be able to take these and manage that in a very structured way. So we have built entire systems that we know that. How do you measure that quality? How do you automate it? You can't look at it manually. It's hugely dimensional. And then also structuring and sourcing that unstructured data, which we'll come to a little bit later on. Let's have another example. <clears throat> this client was a large consumer online and offline. So they were both a high street banking and an online uh, finance organization. And again, they had a conventional and management system. They used credit bureaus and normal scoring, uh, credit scoring and so forth. They had a large, very large in-house data pool that had been going some years, had a lot of information about their clients and so forth. Um, but their default rate was too high and their acceptances were too low in the online system. And again, they were becoming unprofitable. Now, introducing behavioural data like we showed before, and again, talking about the same 4,000 or so items coming in and so forth, the kind of impact it made, very briefly, we can see on the screen, now this is just the behaviour of data, just, no other data at all we've taken. In scenario one, we can see that very rapidly in the first four to six weeks, we were able to reduce um, <coughs> the, um, the default rate there quite rapidly, whilst keeping the acceptance rate the same. Now you can see as we move across cranking up the acceptance rate, quite understandably, the default rate gets higher, obviously because we're accepting more people. But after some considerable training, around about four months long, we can see the end result, where in fact the default rate has come down 44%, but the acceptance is a trend. Now again, this is an exceptional situation, so I'm not saying it works for every bank in the world, but obviously we're working here in a subprime situation, so there's quite big variables going on. But all the same, we can see the impact that behavioural and social data has had on a particular uh, model system. Now this is extremely interesting. I have four graphs here, but I can only actually really show you two. I can explain the difference. The first one shows a segment of the loan portfolio, a very, very large loan portfolio has a plan, bust into its most risky on the left and its least risky on the right. And there we can see a raw probability of default calculated across the entire portfolio. In other words, if we accepted everybody that came into this particular system, that's what the default is. Look, now that has been calculated using just social and behavioural data. No credit bureau data, no external data, no application data, nothing. 
just the raw behavioural data captured at the moment of coming through an application process. Now the next graph will show you the impact of adding in credit bureau application data. And there it is. It looks uncannily similar, doesn't it? So that brings us back to our question, okay, we're only taking 8% of our data from the Bureau, we're taking 50% from the social data and so forth, but maybe all the value is coming from the 8%. It's not. Because now we can see clearly that the actual difference is there, not a great deal. You saw, probably, if you look very quickly, at the far right-hand side of the most or the least riskiest people, yes, it did decline a bit, but it should. <laughs> Ultimately, if we're not accepting those people, we're not trading those people because they're so far ahead of our products that we don't actually trade them, we expect them to find. So, ultimately, we can see that behavioral social data is not only making an impact, which is moving the needle significantly, but it can actually be quite a lot of work just in the time, which is fascinating. And was a complete shock to us. <laughs> now, that's okay about the consumers. Because consumers are sitting there on a mobile phone, or a tablet, or a PC, we can take digital fingerprints of that, tap on the keyboard. We're getting these behaviors coming through, they maintain Facebook accounts. But well, what about the companies? Supposing we're trying to apply the same thing. Do companies exhibit behavior? Of course, we do. And we can take behaviors from the conventional sources. Companies produce accounts, they go to companies' hands. We've got a stock market information, we've got Bloomberg. Credit information coming from the bureaus. We have a lot of information, more so about public companies than we do about private companies, but we do have quite a bit of data. We'll call that, for want a little word, conventional data. But where else can we get data from? Well, we can get it from the web, where it is, of course, in the structure. And this brings us to a very interesting point, because companies have websites, most of them. And the website has a fair amount of information. It might be as thin as 10 pages, it could be turns even hundreds of thousands of web pages and so forth. And one of the projects we started about eight years ago, and here I must have, must have confessed to, to, to a specific interest, we actually built this for a client, but we have actually invested in it because we felt so strongly about it, so we do have an interest in this. But we started to look at the issue, well, okay, let's suppose there's a website, your company's website, there it is. It has information on it about the directors and the executives and products, what we do, the names, addresses, back to numbers, phone numbers, everything, all the stuff that's Holidays. And there it is on, on the 1st of April. And there it is on the 1st of April. And there it is on the 1st of April. That's changing. And those changes, if we can really understand the website intelligently and semantically read it, and actually construct with a high precision rate entities like that, so that we know when the word oracle appears in the center of the website, it means the company. And in the next paragraph, it means the product, because the two happen to be the same. So we can really deeply analyze it to extract entities. We can now start to eject transactions, time series transactions, and we can turn the website not into a one-dimensional, long-time series view of that company, but we can actually generate a time series view over a period. And we can see changes to the site, changes of wallpapers, changes in executives, finance, changes in products, changes in parts, so forth, hundreds of hundreds of fields. In fact, if you look at the next slide, we can see probably 120, 130 fields of data about the company going through this website. Not many, but not many. So about six or seven years ago, we set up a vast array of servers, started building a kind of actual high-level index of the entire web, going through every single URL on the web, and then working out which ones were companies, which is quite a different thing in its own right, extracting the companies, and we now have a database that's covering about just under 20 million companies. And we're generating about 21 million transactions a month, and there's about 465 million in the database. Now, is that data predictive? Yes, it is. As you can imagine, new sales director joins, has an impact. CEO gets fired, has an impact. These things are quite major, major trends. And also, the predictive quality of that data we've managed to lift up into about the mid 90s now, which means it's predictive value. You can see it online, actually, probably drop down the website, uh, you can stream something to Twitter just as an example, so you can be seen on Twitter. Um, you can actually go through the data. So let's look at some now. I happen to log on with the light for a laugh, I was just sitting there on the flat down the road, and I uh, logged on and I dumped down Starbucks transactions from the database. And that was Starbucks website transactions between the 15th of April and the 28th. And I can see there that Troy Olstead was removed as the CFO. And I can 
you see a little bit later, down just there, he was actually in the search of the CEO. He's been promoted. They promoted their CFO to the CEO. I can also see down there, Annie Young the Scribner has been put on the website during the week. But I also happen to know it's just a bit further down, it's just been taken off again. <laughs> so that actually, obviously, is something happened there, maybe related to the company. So I can see a vast number of transactions occurring for each company, each of which are behaviors in that company's profile, which we can then use for predictive purposes. Here's another example. This was taken quite a while, it's only about uh, two or three years ago, four years ago, 2010. Here we can see groups of transactions. There on that company, we can see a period of management reshuffle by the way. We can see Arm, the chip uh, licensing company there, has made some big changes to its parts. We can see this company had a board reshuffle, a management reshuffle, this is back up internationally. Now, interestingly, we Googled it the same day, and that's the Google page. And yes, they mentioned they appointed two executive directors to the board, but they didn't mention they fired five other executives as well. I suspect it's pretty much making the headlines there. So the point about that is we can now start to see behaviours that we haven't seen before because they're just not visible to the human eye and they're not coming through the conventional Bloomberg Reuters type feeds. And so, so in looking at that statement, if we if we capture behavioural data. And social data. Can we lower the cost, improve our trading metrics, know more about the predictive behaviors of our clients? Is that true? Well, yes, it is. And it's happening big time. It happened first with the fringe pioneers, as it always does in our industry. A few early adopters who've got the, the risk taking attitude will go out there and try it. Then maybe it works. A few of them become successful, it becomes like one start to make all the money, becomes a profile. And then suddenly others start to look and then start to mature. And so we're at that stage now where major finance institutions are now starting to adopt these techniques to be able to improve the metrics and performance of the system. What are the issues? Mostly around data collection and quality. They're complex, but they're symmetrical. What are the improvement metrics? Well, some are very significant. Obviously, I think the best ones have ever made real good jumps, but even in the lesser ones, quite significant jumps have been made, which are so significant. Now, generally, those approaches, well, we've seen it in the context of finance products, it applies to any human behavior, particularly in interacting with the web. So, its applicability is very wide across marketing, across customer interactions, collections, food, uh, product marketing, and so forth. So, now, <clears throat> well, it may or may not be relevant to the work that you're doing, but for many of you, it might. You may have a system that is touching people via the web, and there are behaviors coming social systems and behavioural aspects of their own interaction with the system. So are you using them to model and predict and to optimise each step of the process? If so, how much are you use? Could you use more? What's the quality? And even more importantly, how is it measured? Because that's quite a difficult thing to do. Unless you can really measure the quality of the data, then it's very hard to know what the predictive quality of that data is. And therefore, how much better, what sort of impact would it make if, if you optimise those points one to four? How much more could you automate the system? What are the operations that you're going through? Another interesting one is how does an organisation compare to the other market norms? What are the people doing? You know, what are they experiencing with this? How well is it working for them? And then also, of course, what impacts that have? There's no point doing this thing unless it's going to make a real difference to the bottom line. And finally, where do you start? Because it's a huge area with vast amounts of data. Well, there's some good news is that the answers to those questions aren't actually that hard to get. Executing is quite difficult, but the answers to those questions are not difficult. We're very happy to chat to anyone who's interested about that. Please don't hesitate to call or email if you'd like to talk to me. I run through that very, very quickly, but it gives you a broad brush on the area of what we're doing in the social data. I have to take some questions or uh, hand over to John. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh. So I'm sure there will be some questions. So anybody with a question for, for Alan? Yeah, there's one right in the middle, but it's on your side, Gary. Hi, I'm Nick Rose from BA Systems. How much do consumers know that they're giving you all this behavioral data? I don't know. Um, <laughs> they 
certainly give their consent. Whether they know they're giving their consent is hard to say, because I never read the licenses when I click accept or any of those things, so I certainly don't know what I do. I'm being a little bit frivolous there, but I think in the main, um, all of our classes that the privacy statements out, all of them uh, put their app, and if you're logging into your Facebook, then you can access the problem. I think in the main, uh, we're talking about two types of data. One is publicly available. If someone makes their data available on Facebook, they're obviously making it available to the world, so there's no secrets about what's in there. They're actually behavioral data on the device, though. So taking the device fingerprint, for example, we're putting a lot of data from there. And also their interaction, you know, the button raised, and how fast they type, and so forth. It is mentioned in previous but I'd say the vast majority of them are aware of the data you're taking. So it's one of the factors. So what well, Stuart did it, just a related question. Do you think that's going to change? Do you think people are going to start reading some of those uh, privacy statements? Very hard to say. This is purely a non-professional opinion on that. Mm -hmm. I haven't read a, a, a license that I've accepted from the software suppliers since I first clicked many years ago, so I don't think that'll ever change. Maybe something. I think there will always be objections to putting them in. So uh, Tom Wilkinson, government of our society. Uh, obviously, the personal uh, behavioural data would be quite hard to gain because Facebook friends and things like that are dependent on other people's behaviour. But do you not worry about companies gaining their own sort of online reporting in order to influence their scores through the system? I mean, you could even do something as simple as putting reports on your front page which were the same text colour as the background just to trick the system into thinking of something without actually releasing any public information. It's a very good point. A very good point. Gaming the system is actually very helpful. Because ultimately, uh, this came from, from through earlier, you know, people are not always telling the truth, you know, exaggerating their job titles. And people typically, or many people, there are some people out there who will not defraud the insurance companies, but they'll gain it. They'll gain their location because they get a lower premium because they live over there rather than live over here near someone else's address or something like that. These issues come up all the time, but they're actually very useful to us because whilst I wouldn't say by any means we detect 100% of it, we do detect it. And so when we see gaming of the system, it's, it's quite hard to gain the system unless you have the equivalent mathematicians on your side, and some people do. There are forces out there who have their PhD mathematicians doing exactly the same thing as they're doing, sitting there reverse engineering our systems. We know it um, because we've encountered these things. So there are those that, yes, they will sometimes beat the system. But the average end user doing those kind of things, or maybe the company, in the main, it's actually provides useful data because that in itself is a behavior that's useful to us. It's a good point. Other question? Same question. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, this is Colin. Colin Elmer again from Jigsaw. Are you as intrigued when you talked about automating the monitoring, management, and tuning of these very models? Mm. I was wondering how you do that and what kind of parameters. You might set to drive that tuning. Yeah, we're interested in two things. One is the data. So the data is feeding through real time, and there's a large amount of it. And some of the data is coming from the human being actually tapping the keys, and some of it's not. And it's coming from other sources. So we'll take car information, driving license information, all sorts of things, and do the so So we need to check those speeds. So we actually have AI systems based beneath that. We're constantly checking to see if the expected predicted results from that data are in fact coming up, or whether we're starting to deviate. Now, the deviations might be perfectly acceptable, they might be normal. They start, they collect together in bunches to give us a very <coughs> rapid picture that maybe that data is going on the piece. And so we're monitoring that. Now, that in itself can then make the model go on the piece. But let's take another one, let's take it as a fraud detection uh, mechanism. We apply, and this is probably the, the most relevant one to the point in terms of day to day experience because frauds change. Fraudsters are constantly adapting their techniques. As soon as they work out what's being blocked, they'll move on to something else. And so that's again a, 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 an arms race. 
And so what we're looking for there is systems beneath, AI systems again, beneath the core engines looking for anomalous behavior detection, which are not necessarily fraudulent, but indicative that maybe the fraudulent techniques are changing underneath. Now that's a complex area. That's probably one of the most complex that we deal with, data quality and the underlying control of the system. Because this is not a fixed thing, this is a living beast, and it moves and it twists and it turns, and one has to control it in real time. I'd be happy to discuss that in more detail, but it is a very, very complex area. But if you took all of the models and engineering that we have in the platform and added it up, I don't know how you'd measure it, whether they're lines of code or something, you know, some kind of measurement, you'd see an awful lot of that iceberg on the water, which is actually supporting the platform. The models on the top are actually comparatively light. Uh, Hello. Hi, oh, sorry. <laughs> Quick question. You talked a lot about capturing the data, yeah. the quality of data, even capturing the data that you still you don't yet know what you're going to do. What about how long you're keeping the data for? Right? At what point do you decide it's no longer available? That's true. It's a very good point. And I suppose, really, um, we've not thought that through. Um, the earliest platform, the very first online lending platform here in the UK, and pretty much in the States too, to do a click bang and a straight through process the money into the bank account, is only about seven years old. Um, so we only have seven years worth of data at the moment. Now when that gets to be 10 and 15 and so forth, you're right, there's going to have to be some kind of ongoing process. But at the moment, obviously, the data is staked in terms of production, regression testing, more and so forth, so there's a huge amount of staging. But we haven't thrown away anything. As far as, as far as we're concerned, our partners are concerned. It's a good point. Okay. Ruth? Um, absolutely fascinating. And think about the behavioural data um, of individuals. Have you uh, checked for any systemic uh, relationship with? Um, age, ethnicity, any cultural things which actually might be related to leading you to indirect discrimination. So, for example, if there are particular groups, like, you know, all people who don't use Facebook. Yes, absolutely. And of course, there comes back to the point that was earlier mentioned, I think, to one of the questions posed to Dan earlier, was, was the question of compliance. Because you're absolutely right. There's data in there that we can't use. <laughs> so, we just can't. It's there. But we can't use it to make a credit decision because it's, it's not allowed, it's not allowed, it's against the compliance regulations. So yes, there are. Can we see patterns in it? Yes, absolutely we can. But we don't use them. And neither was our client's decision ultimately, but of course their models have to comply. Obviously, it depends as you move around the state, state by state, it varies a little bit, but overall the main things tend to come out. We can't discriminate in terms of ethnicity and gender and so forth. So you're absolutely right. There are things that we don't use. But are there patterns in their behaviour and culture? Absolutely. <coughs> Sorry, I get home. I think what I, what I meant was, Sorry. if, for example, you mentioned you do use speed of typing into, mm. but if that is linked to disability... Oh, I see, yes. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. No, we don't go beyond the initial items. So I think if you took our, our, our menu, our checklist of things that we use, it comes straight from clients, obviously, they come straight from the regulators. So it really is a function of the regulation. Therefore, it says, okay, one may not discriminate against disability, but we'll wait for that and discrimination that aspect might be. But it doesn't go one down beyond that and say, well, okay, that might be indicative of disability. Now, if we know that person is disabled, so for whatever reason, we can't use that for the same time. We don't go beyond that initial, initial point. But you're right, because we, as data scientists, ultimately, we see the data. We see lots of things in the data. Now, our clients happen to be banks who want to lend money and don't want to do things, so that's what they do with it. But we can see many, many other things, verification, and many other official. For example, I really have a personal hobby horse about using it. It's just coincidental we have to give the VMA today, but for health, because we can see some very, very interesting signals coming through in conjunction with other people who work with Google and other companies as well. And you know, we, we can see some very interesting stuff. So there are
are some areas that we'd, we'd like to move into, but for compliance reasons, no, we just touched that one single column, and those items are, are no good areas we don't use. Okay, we could have one last question if there are any. Fifth down there. Uh, fifth rank of the operational research service. So, what controls are there to stop you doing more with that data? Or is somebody else to hold your data to do criminal stuff with it? Um, what controls are there? Well, the controls and the use of that data ultimately are our clients. So, our client collects the data and the data belongs to them. So, they decide they want to use it for either optimizing their marketing or collections or reform or whatever. So, they then work within a set of constraints that apply to their industry. So that would be the normal regulations that they face in terms of their, whether it's the Fed or whatever the organisation is they're controlling the body. And that's it. And ultimately, we are a tool that then manipulates that data, but obviously within those, those constraints. So what controls on us are clients and regulations. Is the regulation clear cut and totally comprehensive? No. <laughs> Will it ever be? I don't know. <laughs> Probably not long after. <laughs> okay. Last, last call. Uh, okay, well thank you all very much and thank you again Al. That was very, very interesting talk.